so in the last class we were trying to discuss crystal field theory so we have seen the octahedral complexes we have seen the tetrahedral complexes these are the two most important classes of compounds that are present over the let's say whatever chemistry known so far there are other complexes as you have seen it could be you know penta coordinated the metal complex can be penta coordinated two different types of geometry is possible for penta coordination out of that trigonal bipyramidal is one of the preferred geometry so there are lot of things that we can definitely go on and discuss about it but it's it's literally impossible to discuss each and every structure in detail each and every metal complex kind of different geometry in detail and how they are you know ligand field will affect the d orbital splitting so geometry changes d orbital splitting pattern changes i think just by learning octahedral and tetrahedral you have got that sense now it has all to do with the way the ligand is approaching sometime ligand is approaching directly towards the atomic orbital of the of each of those metal or d orbital of the metals and thereby you can see the extent to which it gets stabilized or destabilized is differing right so if you take technically speaking if you take a trigonal bipyramidal perhaps you would be able to at least understand why the splitting is such that okay in the syllabus we for for you guys we do not have any other geometry to discuss octahedral and tetrahedral if possible you can look at little bit at trigonal bipyramidal tbp okay now square pyramidal or square planar is something which will come soon square planar is basically nothing but octahedral geometry you are having you take out two z axis you have octahedral scenario you take out two z axis that's become square planar so we'll discuss that so in the last class once again we were discussing warner coordination theory 18 electron rule valence bond theory and how good it is and then how bad it is and how good the crystal field theory is really we will stop there how good the crystal field theory is and not too much we will get into the mo approach molecular orbital approach okay there are i mean no end to learning i think for this course purpose we will stop in there not too much afterwards okay so the major objective for this syllabus or for this chapter and the next chapter is definitely giving you an idea about these high spin low spin complexes the spectrochemical series i hope you have come across this term in the last class crystal field stabilization energy yarn taylor distortion and spinel these are the last two topics we will discuss today i'll briefly give you an overview of what we have discussed in the last class so this is an octahedral complex metal center is there at the middle of it so that is at the center of the geometry it's a metal center metal and ligand are almost having electrostatic interaction it's a positive charge and negative charges are the ligand which are interacting with the metal center remember in the valence bond theory we were mainly assuming it's a covalent structure okay as you see this is axial position that is also axial position this is the direction where dz2 orbital is dz square or dz2 now these are the direction these four 1 2 3 4 these four are the ones where we have dx2 dy2 orbital directly it's not indirect this is where is actually dx2 y2 so therefore from this you can understand why dz2 and dx2 y2 orbital is most destabilized 
for octahedral geometry because they are the one which facing the music basically they are they are the one which is getting rippled most because ligand electrons and the d orbital electrons are rippling each other very simple now all other orbitals d x y d y z d x z they are not facing these ligands directly they are in between somewhere here 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 so in between so thereby they are not going to get rippled too much they are going to get rippled but not too much okay relative to dx2 y2 and dz2 they are going to stabilize okay so just a quick look at the orbitals what we have discussed in the last class dz2 orbital dx2 y2 orbital okay now these are the other orbitals with respect to these three other orbitals you can see where the ligands are therefore you can understand the stabilization or the destabilization of these okay. yeah that's a good question usually that is where we will come to yan taylor distortion okay that i guess that you will be able to clearly understand when we are discussing the jan taylor distortion that is the actually the origin of jan taylor distortion and z elongation and z in okay we'll come back now this is the same thing in a different bottle i think whatever fits you you just look at it it gives you a very clear idea these are the ligands the black balls are the ligands and the and the metal orbitals or d orbitals are shown in here clearly okay no confusion right now as you were showing in the last class so these are d orbitals and this is let's say ligand electrons ligand electrons are coming for these orbitals to overlap right now first instance we will discuss the dz2 interaction with the ligand ligand electrons comes they uh, will be repelling each other therefore dz2 will be destabilized dz2 is facing the ligand once again directly this is the dx2 y2 one okay now here you see that the four ligands are coming along all these axes to answer to that previous question one of the way you can see is these are four lobes four lobes divided by four ligands and two lobes divided by two ligands kind of that's how perhaps it's you know you don't have to worry usually but finer details when it is unsymmetrically filled right dz2 and dx2 although they are of same energy but if they are unsymmetrically filled let's say one is there in the eg orbital or three is there in the eg orbital then the problem comes okay now so you have seen the you have seen how they are coming and thereby they are also getting these orbitals are getting destabilized okay all other d orbital like these three are like dxy dxz and dyz they are really not facing the orbitals directly as you can see they are sitting right in between and thereby you can see so for example over here we have shown dxz same is true for dxy and dyz thereby these orbitals are relatively mind you relatively stabilized with respect to dz2 and dx2 y2 if you compare the free metal ion with respect to free metal ion everything is destabilized because free metal ion has no ligand thereby no repulsion the moment ligand comes repulsion starts so the system's energy goes up okay now overall therefore you have two up three down okay but net stabilization with respect to that barry center the center in the middle the net stabilization or destabilization for a completely filled d orbital let's say d10 or d5 in a high spin situation which we have discussed should be the zero stabilization if it is completely filled 
total stabilization and total destabilization has to be the same ok. Now, this is where again once again this is kind of a clear picture this is a octahedral field we were showing 6 ligands coming at this box. So, if you are um, assuming that this is a box 6 ligands are facing the way it is shown 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, this is the free metal ion, this is the metal complex, 3 of the T 2 G got stabilized, 2 of the E G got destabilized ok. Now, this is E G not E, E will be for tetrahedral T 2 G not T 2 ok. Now, of course, I think I have discussed this information already. Now, since this is 3 of them, this is 2 of them, this distance between this barycenter and the stab stabilization for T 2 G, yeah. Ligand may be different, yeah. Here we are thinking, see we have to ideal deal with the idealistic world at the beginning, M L 6 ligands are same, M L 6. We are not thinking like 3 of the chloride, 3 of the fluoride that is a mixed situation ok. For just to discuss of course, those situation comes often comes, but this is if we do not understand I mean very simple situation how can we go complex ok. So, of course, let us say if you have 3 chloride and 3 cyanide what will be the situation right that that is a special you know topic on this how how finer details you can get in the d orbital splitting initially it may split and then they may further split if you have all of them let us say weak field like 3 fluoride and let us say 3 chloride they may be having behaving same but the moment you have one weak field one strong field ligand things will be little bit complicated ok so overall how much ligand i think Overall, you have to see whether it is a strong field ligand or weak field ligand, whether it is a first point, whether it is a octahedral geometry or tetrahedral geometry and thereby go for it. For the exam purpose for this course, I do not think we will be tricking into anything which is mixed little bit more complicated than that. For exam purpose or for this course purpose, you have to just know octahedral field splitting and tetrahedral. And we will be discussing briefly about the square planar because that is kind of comes automatically. Furthermore, if you want to learn maximum go to trigonal bipyramidal ok, we will give those splitting. But you know as again um, it is a, it's a more complex than we would like to think we are just dealing idealistically ok, that is a good question. So, over here we see that this stabilization should be 0.4 2 by 5 delta 0 0.4 delta 0 this destabilization would be 0 0.6 delta 0 we have discussed it or 4 dq 6 dq if it is delta 0 or 10 dq we have discussed right. Now, the first advantage of this crystal field theory is you can explain the magnetic properties you can expect to explain the you know spectros spectroscopic behavior let us say UVB study of why certain peaks are coming. So, this is where I, I we were telling that if you have an unpaired electron if you are moving from T 2 G to E G the spectra you get will be something like this absorption maximum. Of course, we are not getting into finer details of the spectra, but this is the major origin where from electrons are moving and where it is going. So, from T 2 G this is a D 1 electronic configuration one electron is there. So, T 2 G 1 that means over here T 2 G 1 one electron was over here you all these three orbitals are degenerate same energy only way it can go is up to here. Now, if you think if E G is splitted further the, these these two orbitals are D x 2 y 2 and D z 2 if it is splitted further. So, the electron can go to two different levels right. Therefore, you can expect two different peaks whether intensity will be high or low that is of course, then you have to think about the symmetry and lot of other things which we will not be discussing. But you can 
sense where the spectra is coming from and where the electron is you know moving from I mean which orbital to where it is going ok. So, this is fine. So, you get the spectra. Now, we have also seen crystal field stabilization energy. So, you calculate you are given I think you have to really master this you should be able to do it in your dream ok. D 3 electronic configuration what is the crystal field stabilization energy if octahedral D 5 what is if it is octahedral how many scenarios are there two scenarios how high spin and low spin right. So, what will be the crystal field stabilization energy any question in specially in exam if you see before even thinking too much I would say just imagine the scenarios only three scenarios you have octahedral two scenario high spin low spin and tetrahedral only high spin scenario 99 percent case we will we'll discuss one case today which is otherwise, but that is it octahedral two scenario and tetrahedral one scenario done. So, once you have that I think the answer should come out almost like why something is preferred why something is not preferred at least I would say out of 25 mark question 5 marks to 7 marks will be based on that indirectly I mean of course, it will not be given perhaps on a platter definitely you will be able to figure out about that. So, please do familiar you should not be fearing about calculating and electronic configuration should be always correct there should not be any mistake ok. Now, so D 5 system for example, one case we were giving. So, this is the D 5 high spin that means 3 stabilization to destabilization CFSE should be 0 right that is what I was trying to say. So, net stabilization and destabilization should be 0 if it is symmetrically filled ok. So, this is 0 you do not have to even calculate if it is D 10 it is again 0 D 10 means all of them are full. So, stabilization is equals to destabilization. So, that is where let us say you are given D 7 and this is the configuration 5 6 7. So, 5 take out 5 because 5 3 plus 2 has stabilized destabilized and cancel each other out. Now, you just deal with 2 2 will be D 7 2 will be over here and here right. So, that will be minus 8 D Q or 0.8 delta 0 or de delta octahedral. You should be able to do it really, really quick without calculating and going through the simple math. Now, of course, D 7 you can have also high spin and low spin configuration. For example, this one what would be the CFAC minus So, of course, minus that is out of question it is stabilization each of them are 0.4. So, 5 of them 20 minus 20 or minus 2 uh, sorry yeah minus uh, 2 delta 0 ok that is it delta 0 means delta octahedral delta O I mean different people pronounce it different way ok. So, this is it I mean if you do it really simply I am sure 5 to 7 mark question will be there I mean invariably whatever it is the question is based on that it is going to be based on that. Now, of course, we have discussed it two once again two scenarios high spin because the spin is maximum high spin low spin means spin is minimum you see one unpaired spin. Now, if you look at the I will come back to the magnet magnetic behavior magnetic behavior is nothing but due to the unpaired electron right. So, the moment you have unpaired electrons magnetic behavior comes because the parallel spin will cancel each other you want to spin on that direction and I want to spin on this direction. So, it will be canceller cancelling. So, this is the one will have low magnetic value magnetic moment value this is the one will have high magnetic value this is the origin for molecular magnet a lot of molecules are magnet ok and these are the ones you see the application almost everywhere literally everywhere you take any electronic gadgets you take almost anything 
which is electronic in nature, which has some fancy application, it is the material, it is the material which are having magnetic properties and that is why they are used, how expensive it is based on that you know you will, you will get your material. Of course, in lot of other cases you see the use of these things, I will show one or two cases today. Okay. So, dependence of delta 0 like how much splitting is going on that depends on the nature of the ligands as I was trying to tell you whether it is a weak field ligand or strong field ligand. Strong field means the splitting will be very high, weak field means the splitting between T 2 G and E G will be small and therefore, for weak field ones we will always see high spin means spin will not be pairing up. Okay. And the charge on the metal of course, if it is a high higher charge you will have higher separation. If it is 5 D you will have higher separation compared to 3 D right. So, this is the spectro electrochemical series with respect to different ligands. These are the stronger one stronger ligands these will these are the one which almost always will give you the low spin comp sorry high uh, which one low spin complex because the splitting will be high. Strong field ligand splitting will be high. So, the spin pairing will happen it cannot go from T 2 G to E G. Okay. These are the one which are likely to give you low spin complexes. Is it getting clear if it is you are getting I mean sometime it, it is little bit confusing it is either yes or no type of answer question I mean the understanding is either yes or no high spin or low spin right. So, just get it clear. Now, this is the trend we have shown for tetrahedral case we were dealing with a completely different scenario which can be clearer from this picture. If you remember the previous picture for octahedral case which was nothing but direct confrontation here it is like more of a political approach okay. um, you know diplomatic approach you do not go direct you just talk with. Okay. So, they are talking and they are not directly confronting thereby the scenarios are completely different since it is not interacting directly overlapping directly with let us say those E g orbitals previously we have seen for octahedral cases d x 2 y 2 and d z 2 d z 2 is over here actually and see the ligand where it is ligand is here d z 2 is here actually those orbitals are the ones those E g orbital for octahedral case are the ones which are farthest from the ligand which are farthest and thereby they are the one which will get stabilized. The other three orbitals d x y, d y z, d x z those are the ones which are nearer not directly overlapping, but closer and thereby they are destabilized. Okay. Now, this difference is called delta t and this delta t is going to be 4 ninth of the delta O or delta 0, 2 third coming from the number of ligands 6 to 4 octahedral to tetrahedral, another 2 third coming from indirect approach not from direct approach. If it was directly approaching that is the case of octahedral case, but here indirect approach basically you can calculate based on the angle which angle it is coming. Okay. So, roughly roughly these are like rough calculation it is becoming 2 third times 2 third 4 9 of delta 0. So, delta t is always less therefore, you never see almost never ever see low spin case for tetrahedral. Since, the splitting is very less always you end up getting high spin case. So, never ever calculate tetrahedral for high spin uh, sorry low spin. Now, this is the electronic configuration and their respective stability if you are comparing delta octahedral and delta tetrahedral directly. So, what happens how much stability is there if it is d 1 for octahedral case 
D1 for tetrahedral case and we are comparing apple versus apple that means high spin versus high spin, high spin of octahedral and high spin of tetrahedral, tetrahedral cannot have low spin. In tetrahedral case we have to normalize the value with the 4 9 of delta 0, these two you do it you will get this should be you should be able to get it ok. Now this is the topic today we are going to discuss spinel, spinel are the ones which is let us say this nice looking gem looking thing or gem basically magnesium aluminum oxide it is beautiful in color ok. Of course color comes from you know where the color is coming from those transition ok. Now definition is spinel is very simple you can have either same metal or different metal ok. It could be let us say Fe3O4, CO3O4 or it could be MgAl2O4 three metals should be there two of them should be the same as you see at least two of them has to be the same will be the same usually speaking again or one is different MgAl2O4 something like that. Now Ab2O4 is the general formula for spinel. The normal spinel are the one there are two type of spinel as I said normal there would be abnormal two spinel or inverse spinel no we do not say abnormal inverse spinel. Normal spinel are the one where you have this electronic configuration it is always going to be O4, 4 oxides are there that means minus 8 each oxide minus 2, 4 of the oxide will be minus 8. Now minus 8 means you have almost 1 possibility in realistic possibility 3 plus 3 plus 2 of course other possibilities are there those are less likely never happens for spinel. So 3 plus 3 plus 2 since it is 3 plus in the normal behavior or normal spinel cases you would expect the octahedral geometry or octahedral geometry will be preferred by 3 plus and tetrahedral geometry will be preferred by 2 plus. Let us look at the you know over here magnesium aluminum this is octahedral you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 each aluminum is octahedral. You look at magnesium it is having 4 ligands it is in a tetrahedral I think most likely 1, 2, maybe 3 and 4. Magnesium is in tetrahedral geometry aluminum is in octahedral geometry ok. Yes, so over here this is further showing you that 1, 2, 3, 4. So one of them so it is a it is a little bit complicated looking thing but if you go by unit cell if you break down the complex structure and look at the core of it each of the metal ions A, B2, O4 both the B will be in octahedral geometry ok. Sometime it is just not clear by looking one glance at it ok. You have to just look it little bit carefully you will be able to understand where it is ok. And these are usually the crystal structures so there should not be any ambiguity you just have to look it carefully. So both the octahedral will be in plus uh, both the plus 3 oxidized metal will be in octahedral state and the one which is 2, two plus will be in tetrahedral geometry and 4 oxides are there. If this is the case this is normal spinel. If other way around if one of these octahedral M3 plus has to be pushed out from this octahedral side to tetrahedral side that will be called inverse spinel. So all it depends on whether one of these M3 plus will be in octahedral side or tetrahedral side that is it. 
of course always there will be one metal 3 plus which is in octahedral site this is common the second metal 3 plus whether it is exchanging with this other metal that is what you need to see is it clear normal spinel normal behavior 3 plus should be octahedral right it is a privileged class 3 plus higher oxidation step octahedral should be right it is a high high charge everything should be ligand should be interacting more and so on but that is like normal behavior if it is other way around octahedral site is coming out and tetrahedral is going into the octahedral one or 2 plus is going into the octahedral one this is when it is called inverse spinel inverse spinel normal spinel now when what is the criteria simply you have to see metal this metal in 3 plus whether it prefer prefers octahedral or metal 2 plus what it prefers let me show you so m3 plus ion has when m3 plus ion has a higher crystal field stabilization energy okay compared to m2 plus ion then this is a normal spinel okay if m2 plus ion has a higher cfac then it is inverse spinel so you don't have to really look at the tetrahedral you don't have to look at the tetrahedral you take the metal ion m3 plus m2 plus for a given metal ion you find out m3 plus and m2 plus they are cfac separate cfac if m3 plus is more than normal if m3 plus is less having less cfac compared to m2 plus then it is inverse just read these two lines so expectation is m3 plus in octahedral and this is usually going to be high spin should have high cfac of course opposite is true m2 plus octahedral high spin should have low cfac cfac calculation we have learned how to do if this is done normal opposite inverse normal spin and inverse spin don't mix up with calculation of octahedral versus tetrahedral sometime people end up doing that they go into wrong direction okay so you have to just calculate octahedral site stabilization energy like how much stabilization is there so that's what it is written m3 plus ion has a higher cf cfac in an octahedral field compared to m2 plus ion in normal spinel and so on do not calculate for the m3 plus in tetrahedral okay yeah so this is where i mean yes then uh, how will you conclude right so you have to step figure out the stability of m3 plus versus m2 plus right this other otherwise it will get confused what will you be will you be comparing with right cfac for tetrahedral is usually low four nines of delta o what to calculate okay so let me give you an example it will be clearer yeah more negative see any in terms of energy in chemistry physics everywhere energy means the one which is having low cfs or low anything low repulsion is stable low energy i mean it's stable okay anything low would be stabilized it's like as i was i think i was trying to say it's like home feeling you want to feel home everybody wants to belong somewhere and that's where they they want to go right so always low okay stability should be maximum yeah
uh, no, no, that is the splitting delta. So that is the splitting we, we are comparing. When we are not changing anything, ligand keeping constant, metal oxidation state varying, metal with a higher oxidation state will have higher splitting. Okay, that is somewhat true here, but I mean we are not saying the extent to which. We are trying to tell here is M3 plus M2 plus, yes you are partially right, M3 plus M2 plus you just calculate the CFAC. Okay. Let me give you this example, hopefully things will be clear. Okay. MN3O4, okay. MN3O4 ox, of course here oxygen usually always, I mean not always, again there will be one example which is other way. Usually oxides for these cases are going to be the weak field ligand. Okay, it is a weak field ligand. Now, unless the metal is very high, you know, very high oxidation state or so, oxide will be the weak field ligand. Okay, you don't have to worry about the oxide too much, except in one question which will come. Manganese 2 plus D5. Since it is weak field ligand, it is a high spin. That's what I was saying. High spin. Now high spin is zero CFAC. Manganese 3, 4, 3 plus D4 is T2G3 EG1. So you are going to get net minus 0 0.6 delta zero. That is what you have calculated, right? Should be okay. M minus 12 minus 6. So uh, sorry, plus 6. Minus 12 plus 6 is minus 6 dq. Okay. Now this is the normal spinner. How about Fe3O4? Can you calculate Fe3O4? Whoever is trying to calculate, try give yourself one minute. Fe3O4, Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus. Okay. Try, okay, whoever got it, hold on for a minute. Inverse spinel, yes, that's the correct answer. Just I'll, in a moment, I'm looking for something. So I hope you have got this, right? Fe2 plus D6, T2G4, EG2, high spin. Three and two cancels out. Three over here and two over here cancels out. So minus four. It's easy, right? Over here, three and two, zero CFAC, right? Now, Fe3, as you can see, is having less CFSC compared to Fe2. So that's it. So inverse spinner. Do not, only request is do not complicate too much. You think, but for calculation, do this. Because if you end up calculating tetrahedral, Fe3 plus case tetrahedral, Fe2 plus case tetrahedral, it's going nowhere. Okay. It's a simple thing. Higher oxidation state should try to stay in the octahedral side. The moment higher oxidation state becomes less favorable compared to the lower oxidation state, switch of the power happens. It's just the BJP and Congress. You have to pick up one of them in the center, not the local, okay, or Democratic or Republican. You, you do not have any choice. Okay. Now, so this is the special case, special case of D8 octahedral, right. So what is the special case? We are eluding before that these DZ2 orbital are the one getting repelled by two electrons. This is a D8 electronic configuration as you can see, T2G6, EG2. And this is the one repelled by four ligands. Okay. That is unfair. That is where what happens is Z orbital okay, try to stabilize to minimize the energy, to, to gain more energy. So you start with an octahedral situation. 
but you see d8 you go blank d8 octahedral will tend to form square planar geometry okay because the z you will see square planar complex is formed because z will get destabilized uh, sorry stabilized z is getting stabilized as you can see z orbital will get destabilized this is an unfavorable situation this is a situation which cannot be tolerated this is two ligands refilling four ligands refilling right this is the unique situation one one unique situation same electron repelled by one electron repelled by two one electron repelled by four in order to bring some sort of calmness to the system z orbital will stabilize if you want to stabilize x2 y2 orbital then the problem becomes stabilization means repulsion is less that's the stabilization repulsion less is the stabilization if you want to stabilize dx2 y2 orbital then you have to elongate four of the ligands stabilization means you know reducing the repulsion if you are stabilizing z square then you just need to take out those axial ligands take it was here two axial ligands were here you pull it out so z will be stabilized dz square will be stabilized of course further it will be stabilized any z component there will get stabilized so dxz will be stabilized dyz will be stabilized this is the scenario where square planar complex goes d8 octahedral usually will be i mean if it is possible always it will go to the square planar situation that is also true d8 d8 tetrahedral or d8 four ligands are not tetrahedral d8 configuration four ligands are going to be square planar okay this is where you see iron cobalt nickel nickel is nickel 2 plus d8 is square planar all right now this is one scenario I, other scenario is that eg orbital is unsymmetrically filled see you can see that majority of the syllabus is biased towards octahedral okay tetrahedral not too much but that's because octahedral is favored octahedral is historically more important and that's what most of the study has been done uh, and it's a common geometry more common geometry i would say now <coughs> this is the yan taylor distortion of course you can some people pronounce at differently in british in england you will go pronounce differently us it will pronounce differently yan taylor some people tell some people tell jan taylor whatever it is it's the same thing jt distortion um so what we see if this one is unsymmetrically filled what are the situation when it is eg3 or eg1 that's the only two possibility eg2 will be symmetrically filled eg4 will be symmetrically filled eg1 or eg3 if it is filled then again you are having some sort of a problem what is the problem that is what we are coming to let me go to the picture okay this is what is yan taylor distortion if of course t2g is completely filled okay completely filled or symmetrically filled either t2g is t2g3 eg1 or t2g6 eg3 all these configuration so what are the configuration t2g3 eg1 t2g6 eg1 t2g6 eg3 so wherever unsymmetrical situations are possible of course t2g3 eg3 is not possible right t2g3 eg3 is not possible because it would be t2g4 t2g3 eg4 is not possible so this sort of thing you should be able to recognize very quickly t2g3 eg4 actually should be t2g4 
is u2 right why means it's a stabilization you look at very good question right so t2 g3 eg sorry eg this is did i say 3 oh, everything i said is correct 3 plus 3 6 4 plus 2 okay 6 now t2 g3 eg2 this is the t2 g3 eg2 high spin if you are even con say, saying now how it can be going over there because it is giving more more energy or destabilizing the system this sixth electron should come here see the always filling rules anywhere i mean you read the huns principle you read whatever other principle system has to be stabilized when two scenarios are there system goes for stabilization but when high spin low spin situation is there because high spin is accessible it goes for high spin or it can go to low spin here after filling out 1 2 3 if it is high spin 4 5 sixth electron will come back from here it's home right it's stable so t2g3 eg3 is not a valid configuration it is t2g4 eg2 it is invalid i mean literally it is possible for an excited state if you excite t2g4 eg2 then it can come to t2g3 eg3 this is usually all we are talking about is ground state electronic configuration okay any confusion on that no hopefully not now jt jantelar distortion t2g t2g either fully filled or half filled t2g6 or t2g3 here it has to be unsymmetrically filled means eg2 and 4 is out of question eg1 or eg3 two orbitals are there okay what can happen two scenarios are there either dg2 can be stabilized or dx2 y2 can be stabilized now stabilization again stabilization means what stabilization means repulsion is less okay stabilization means less repulsion less repulsion when it can happen when ligand is not coming if z square is stabilizing that means along that direction ligands are far so this will be too long this that will be so the left hand scenario this is a base for octahedral scenario we are drawing this is the equatorial plane axial was here now it this is let's say normal scenario if i want to say that dz square orbital is stabilized that means this ligand is not this is the dz square orbital direction right so that means ligand is not coming close to this dz square orbital this is where the dz square orbital is right so it is not coming close that means it is going far and that is how dz square can be stabilized that means two of them two of the ligands should be at a longer distance and four of them at a shorter distance or relatively shorter distance the opposite is here when relatively speaking dx2 y2 is getting stabilized that means these are going out stabilize means repulsion is less ligands in the second scenario ligands will be further uh, further away and z was over here so z in this is called z in z direction getting in this is called z out okay it's a very very simple thing if you just try to understand very simply 
do not complicate things it is that very simple now as you can see z z out this is the z out if you keep on moving more and more z out becomes your square plane right so here previous case what we were discussing if z becomes stabilized more 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 and so that it is you are taking too far from the metal center octahedral is no longer octahedral it is becoming square planar okay so z in and z out yeah sorry No, these are having same energy, right? No, these are see these are degenerate. You cannot dictate the term. You cannot tell who is where you want. It's just this is just for nomenclature sake. I have written just to you know, just to tell you or just to write you something. I have write, written which one is dz2 or which one is dx2. You don't know. It is same energy, right? d generate means same energy 5d orbitals before crystal field theory we used to think that same energy we don't discriminate right so this is just a representation sake ah, not all the cases but when it is unsymmetrically filled then it is becoming a problem see three four scenarios are there eg orbital why eg orbital is getting part, part of why t2g not because those are the one you can see these are the outside if you see the splitting wise those are the one facing the maximum of the ligand repulsion right in eg four configurations are there eg1 eg2 eg3 eg4 eg2 scenario we have already discussed eg2 scenario is the one where we are getting most most often we are getting that d8 t2g6 eg2 eg2 that is a d8 electronic configuration it tends to go for a square planar one fine you remained with eg1 or eg3 eg1 and eg3 scenario we are trying to discuss here so when it is symmetrically or fulfilled then usually we don't get bothered it's you know other way or one way or the other it is just the same i mean you know it's completely full so nothing to really compare with but in this scenario when you have unsymmetrical filling then you have the chance of splitting see similar split the extent of splitting you can see is not the same here again of course usually speaking these are the one eg are the one which are going to face the ligand directly and thereby splitting starts over there and then of course sometime it also get affected t2g gets affected that's why we have we were showing initially we didn't split it initially we when we were discussing t2g6 eg2 we were showing that dz2 is getting stabilized when it is getting further stabilized and this then it is going to get split further okay so look at the slide almost in every book it has been written really well if you have any confusion please come back okay or discuss with your friends so z in and z out this is z out z out means z you are pulling out stabil stabilization happening okay now this is a slide which is uh, mostly left for you to digest little bit square planar geometry so if you want to memorize sometime things can be problematic we want to read you mainly let's say octahedral 3 to octahedral where is tetrahedral tetrahedral is not given here anyway the geometry and thereby they are splitting how they are going to split this is not all of them is part of the syllabus again this is just a overview giving an idea how ligands are coming how d orbitals are getting perturbed which direction d orbitals are located and then from which direction ligands are coming of course that is what going to determine what is their geometry if it is a square planar where it is coming you know 
if it is a tri trigonal bipyramidal or TBP, three of them in the equatorial pen, triangle, one from the top, one from the below. So, which are the orbitals going to get affected and to what extent and so on. So, these are you know, these are these are in the book or may, may not necessarily you have to read it. You are, uh, but you are supposed to read octahedral, tetrahedral, square planar. I think for fun you can look at that, try to justify a little bit. Okay. So, that is it for this chapter. Let us see magnetism. Okay. Magnetism, if you have, this is I guess chapter 4, chapter 4 right, chapter 4 for your syllabus, magnetism. Okay. We will not finish the magnetism, all of it today. So, magnet you are familiar with. Okay. I will give you some very simple, very simple uh, pictorial uh, representation. Magnet is basically magnet is everywhere. Okay, how it is? It is really up to the universe also. It's what all we see is magnet. Okay, what is magnet? Anything? I think the simple definition is or how the magnet is created. Anything that has a rotation, moment, or some rotational behavior, it can create some field around it. See electron, proton, neutron, every object that can rotate can create some sort of field that is what I will come into. I think magnet is everywhere you can trace back to the origin of life. Okay. Now, what is next? Okay. You can basically from universe to your atom level if you go, all of them are having some sort of spinning behavior. Okay. Two types of spinnings are possible. One is as you know, one is rotating around its own axis and a, 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 a another is orbital. Rotating, rotating, that is how the sun rotates, that is how the earth rotates, that is how the moon rotates. You, sorry? So, it rotates around its own axis, that is the spinning spin component, it rotates around the orbital, that is the orbital component. And the total, these are two vectors basically, you do the vector addition, you get the net magnetic moment. Okay. We will come to that, that is what is this chapter about. But to speak you very clearly, the unpaired electrons are the one which causes most of the magnetic, prop, I mean which induces the magnetic properties into the molecule. So, not only the bigger thing like earth, sun, moon, we see the magnetic behavior due, due to their you know spinning behavior or rotating behavior. The as small as the molecule, even you can go further in as, as I think we are trying to discuss the complex, complex means metal complex, metal ligand is there metal d orbitals are there, those d orbital electrons are the one which are essentially giving us the magnetic behavior in different application what we are using nowadays. Different whatever electronic devices, even for our you know this ATM card to wherever you, you see that anything is has to do with the unpaired electron, those are coming from the metal complexes. Okay, let's, let me get into. So, we will discuss the magnetism of, of, of the metal complexes and then get into the lanthanide actinides or lanthanide specifically and then stop. Okay. So, I think we, I was discussing moment ago, paired and unpaired electron pairs. Unpaired electron pairs are the one which will be giving this magnetic behavior because paired electrons will be cancelling out each other. Spinning of electron as you can see spinning of electron and this is the pairing of electron. So, spinning the un what is that called I mean unpaired electron 
will be giving you the magnetic behavior paired electron will cancel each other out ok. Now can you see this behavior can you just from simple experiment can you determine the magnetic behavior of a, any compound such as oxygen nitrogen oxygen is a gas nitrogen is a gas are they paramagnetic or diamagnetic sorry yes how how would, will you do this experiment simply what you usually do you cool it down if you take even nitrogen gas liquid nitrogen you have heard of liquid nitrogen big tank goes on and you know funny lot of funny experiments can be done um, if you liquefy the nitrogen gas it becomes liquid nitrogen now that liquid nitrogen we want to see whether that nitrogen is going to be diamagnetic or paramagnetic simply if you take a magnet this is a magnet ok it is a big magnet and you pour liquid nitrogen through it you will see that I mean magnet opposite direction should attract each other you will see there is no attraction. So, this is what a simple experiment can tell you that liquid nitrogen is going to be diamagnetic in nature same thing you do with oxygen as you are correctly saying that it is paramagnetic you can do the experiment you see it is sticking to the magnet that is the simplest one of the experiment you can do which can show you what the molecule is made of oxygen nitrogen it is amazing actually if you think very simply but do not try to liquefy oxygen it can it, it can be bad ok do not do this it is it could be a lot of bad things can happen afterwards if you do not know how to handle it ok right of course there are lot of other things you see magnetic levitation like suspension you see the magic PC Sarkar or whoever big magician you know of you see they are showing sometime you see this movie uh, one of the Hollywood movie what was that prestige I like that ok um, well, see the lot sometimes body is floating right you, you know that of course if you look at the movie if you go to the movie a theater or in a, of course you can watch today tonight if you want there is some some science behind it. So, you can make some object as 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 big as like someone like us a human being float in air sometime that also of course can give you the thought sometime in the ancient history Indian history we see that people are walking on the water I do not I mean I do not know whether other supernatural things are there or some extra thing are there, but something like this you can explain perhaps scientifically as well that there is opportunity for science to contribute I do not know, you know I do not want to caught into some sort of controversy here. Um, so, something can be floated you can float something like I think movie is not working even a you know what is this fruit strawberry yeah I would I, I love it. So, strawberry can be floated right well of course uh, this is uh, interesting a magnet right uh, otherwise I think um, magnetochemistry if you are to discuss you have to understand electron spin see this is little bit physics in there I will try to skip it because you have studied it already it is all well, we will show you the equations. So, an electron has two intrinsic spin state which are prefer refer as up and down or alpha and beta spin ok alpha and beta spin electron orbital motion is nothing but what you see in the universe you know center is nucleus and electron is spinning ok. Now, nuclear spin of course, some nucleus are also having spin you just read ok it becomes little bit boring to teach because you know it ok. Now, magnetism this is an equation what we are trying to say we have a magnetic field you put an object into the magnetic field um, a molecule d orbital containing d orbital or 
any non magnetic molecule whatever net effect it could be a non magnetic any molecule you can put any object you put this one okay the net magnetic behavior or uh, magnetism you are going to get is the magnetic field plus whatever it can induce on it the magnetic field can induce some magnetic behavior inside it or in it so this is what the equation is the magnetic field what gets generated or total magnetic field you get is equal to the applied magnetic field h and the intensity of magnetization how much magnetization it is going to have or how much hypnotized or magnetized it is going to get that's the total total magnetic field within the substance what's the field not only the field you create what's the material made of that makes a difference the type of material you have that makes a difference okay all of you are in iit there all of you are attending the same class some of you will be millionaire trillionaire and you will give me some money i'll be very happy right um donate profusely when you are donating g khol ke donate karo okay give back to iit okay really i mean we need money a uh, lot of money all of a lot of you will be having i'm sure startup companies some of them them will be bought out by some established company you will be filled the rich you have no idea what to do afterwards just think about me okay for a moment okay wherever I, you are just think about me when you make money otherwise don't think really uh, we cannot help so all right i think this is simple physics you know what to do with it you have studied it before in 12 standard you study it again okay now what are the things we are interested in for this class we are interested in few parameters like you know b by h okay and this kappa value right so that's i'll i'll go to the another equation so the the susceptibility and the magnetic moment okay the susceptibility is related to magnetic moment and these are the two terms we are interested in okay remember we will be discussing again in the next class so you study a little bit if you have any queries i can come back and discuss again now susceptibility molar susceptibility you molar how do you get molar susceptibility divided by divided by total um, mole right or avogadro number now from there on you you get the molar susceptibility and mu these two are related like that and you get a equation to calculate magnetic moment how it equates equate with the magnetic susceptibility now all we need to care sorry we are coming back again all we need to care for for this course we we are mainly trying to see the metal complexes with unpaired electrons d electrons right so number of unpaired electrons is going to matter to us because the unpaired electrons are the one which are going to give you the magnetic moment okay of course we need to worry about high spin and low spin because that will also determine indirectly what is going to be the number of unpaired electrons and from there we can of course try to see the spectral behavior and structure of the complex now many transition metal salts and complexes are paramagnetic of course due to their partially filled d orbitals the moment everything gets filled you don't get much of a magnetic moment the experimentally major magnetic moment and of course the equation i was talking can provide some important information about the compound themselves so what we do we have a compound we try to measure the magnetic moment and we have an equation from where we can calculate the magnetic moment now we try to see the difference between the two and try to explain what is the reason if experimental values are differing 
ok. Let me get into it, it will be little bit clearer. So, as I was saying the source of magnetism in the molecule is going to be your unpaired electron that is all. Now, the unpaired electron can have two sorts of or two sources of creating magnetism. One is spinning around its own axis just and another is while spinning around its own axis it is also rotating on the uh, along the orbital right. So, two components the M L or L component angular sorry orbital component for which it is rotating around the orbital and the other component is the spin spinning around its own axis or along its own axis two components. But the d orbitals are the one which are getting affected mostly by the ligand metal d orbitals are getting affected by the ligands. So, the ligand will not allow too much to spin around its orbital. So, the L component mu orbital component will be usually minimized let us say 0. Lig the metal electrons will only be able to give you spin only value spinning they are spinning they are not able to freely rotate around its orbital because ligand electrons are overlapping and ligand electrons are restricting them. So, essentially what you need to understand is the magnetic or mu total is ending up to be what spin only value, but in reality you have to have the spin only value and the mu orbital value coupled together or you it is a vector addition you can do and that is what the mu total is going to be. In reality it is going to be the mu spin only value clear two components are there one component will be marginalized of course, I am not saying it is 0 ok. It has will come back that is what will be seeing the orbital contribution and there is usually one or two questions are asked from orbital contribution which is little bit exciting. But usually speaking two components are there one is nullified another is left that is the spin only ok. Now, what is the equa equation over here? This is the mu L plus S both orbital and spin this is the equation this is the correct equation this is the incorrect or partially true equation, but this is the one which we do care. What is the correct equation? It has uh, total number of unpaired electron and those L values you have to know all of them this is the theoretically calculated value ok. Now, in reality this is the spin only formula where you get rid of the L value it, it is one root over 1 by root over or uh, sorry root over this spin component and L component right. But if you get rid of that component it becomes 4 s into s plus 1 root of that right if you get rid of that component orbital component. Now, s is nothing but number of unpaired electron you are having ok. So, s equals total s equals number of unpaired electron divide by 2 or you can convert this equation by putting putting the number of unpaired electron it becomes n into n plus 2 n times n plus 2 root of that simple that is what you need to remember. I think you have studied it before ok n multiplied by n plus 2 the root of that ok. So, if you have one unpaired electron you know 1 multiply by 1 plus 2 root of 3 1.73 2 unpaired electron 2 plus 2 multiply by 2 root of 8 2.83. So, 1 it is a there is an easy way to remember it 1 1.73 2 2.83. So, 1 unpaired electron 1 plus 0.73 2 
2 unpaired electron 2 plus 0.83, 3 unpaired electron 3 plus 0.8, 4 unpaired electron 4 plus 0.9, I mean 0 0.7 let us say, 1, 1.7, 2.7, 3.7, 4.7 and 5.7, it is close. Anyway, that is how you, you do not have to every time do use your calculator. Okay. Now, this is the spin only formula. Now, we, we need to really get to see now whether the spin only formula is valid always, what we get experimentally when it deviates, how it deviates. Okay. That is what we are going to discuss. These are for the purist. Okay. Now, we will we'll discuss when we are going to get something like called orbital contribution. What is orbital contribution? Orbital contribution is nothing but orbital contribution, right. Uh, so, what is it? Orbital contribution. So, in addition to spin only values, if there is some rotation around the orbit, specifically it comes when you, you have again, um, again orbitals which are un, unsymmetrically filled like T 2 G 4. So, there is some sort of transition from one orbit, orbital to other, when you can multi, write down multiple electronic configuration T 2 G 4, it could be d x y 2, d y z 1, d x z 1 or other way around also. You can among the three degenerate orbitals, you can write down differently, right. So, this is when the orbital contribution comes because since the electrons can be you know delocalized or can be placed in different orbital and thereby you have the possibility of promoting some of the orbital you know some sort of movement or some sort of magnetic moment can be generated due to these you can say the transition due to this due to this mobilization of electron from one orbital to another d x y to d y z to d x z, but can you do that? That is what the question. So, that is what we want to see can we interconvert d x y into d y z or d x 2 y 2 into d y z that is. So, the orbital contribution is nothing but spin only value plus something extra you get. Usually speaking spin only value should be good enough and our calculated number of unpaired electron should give us the exact value the experiment is going to give us. Often what we see that experimental value are little bit more then number of unpaired electron calculation. How do you calculate number of unpaired electron? That is by your crystal field theory. How many unpaired electrons are there? T 2 G E G calculation you do. So, number of unpaired electron calculation should give you a very close idea what is going to be your magnetic moment. That is your theoretical calculation. Correct theoretical calculation should include the L plus S orbital moment also, but orbital moment calculation is or that much value we do not get. The value what experimentally we get is usually close to the spin only value, but on top of that spin only value itself is not going to be sufficient some or very little amount of orbital momentum value comes when it comes this is the scenario we are going to discuss. So, I will just briefly I think little bit confusing maybe I have made it. So, there is always L plus S contribution, but I am trying to say you just minimize it to S, but in reality S plus let us say delta L very little contribution from L. When this comes? Usually you see your experimental data and theoretically predicted data are same. Some cases you have to worry about the orbital angular momentum, when you have to worry about orbital angular momentum. When you can convert 
one orbital to another. Thereby, you have the possibility of distributing the electron in different, different ways. Then only you can do that. Now, the degenerate T 2 g orbital d x y d x z d y z can be interconverted as is shown in here. You just rotate little bit, you can interconvert, right. Thus an electron in a T 2 g orbital can contribute to orbital angular momentum. But what happened to E g? So, this is the transition from d x z to d z x to d y z. You just rotate the orbital, it is a plane d x y plane let us say, you just rotate 90 degree, you get another one, if it is d x z you get uh, initial and then finally you get d y z, right. You should be able to do that, you just take it, take, take a piece of paper and rotate how much angle you are rotating, you should be able to do. Now, if you look at E g orbital, E g orbital you have d z square and d x 2 y 2, any amount of rotation is it going to give you the interconversion? No. So, E g orbital cannot give you the um, you know the cannot contribute for your orbital contribution, right. Now, E g orbital cannot contribute to orbital angular momentum, right. So, but there is a way to convert the E g into T 2 g, how it is d x 2 y 2 or d x y can be converted to d x 2 y 2 and vice versa, right. So, there is some way to do that and then you know that d x d o once you get d x y d x y can be converted into d y z d x z. So, these are kind of interconvertible. So, what is not interconvertible orbital wise? So, d y d d z square to anything else you cannot do, but four of them can rest four of them can be interconverted. Okay. Now, orbital contribution to the magnetic moment. Once again magnetic moment is spin plus orbital contribution should be there, orbital contribution is usually 0, orbital contribution can come when it is something like this. Okay. T 2 g electron arrangement, right. Think of possible T 2 g electron arrangement, it can be d 1, d 1 can be organized as it is shown d x z, d y z and d x y. Possible T 2 g arrangement is 3, 3 different ways you can put the electrons, thereby orbital contribution is yes, d 1 in titanium 3 plus. So, if you calculate the angular uh, to total magnetic moment for these, one electron should give you what 1.73, it will be little bit more than that. Let us say experimentally found value is 1.83 instead of 1.73. Why it is that? Because it is coming from here. Because, because see if it is fixed on an orbital, if it is fixed in this orbital, maybe your of course, your ligand electrons and this elect, this ligand orbital overlap with the with the uh, d orbitals will be rot I mean restricting the rotation. Since, if there is multiple orientation possible, then that can cause see anything that that is allowed to rotate allowed to spin, allowed to rotate will give you the some magnetic moment value. You are able to rotate among these orbitals, the orbitals that should allow you some sort of magnetic moment value. Okay. I, I think I, I, I should give a better explanation, okay. I will I'll have to look at that. But that is I think the moment you are freezing something, you are not going to get it. If d orbital, if this d orbital is going to overlap with the ligand d orbital, okay, then complete overlap means you are going to restrict the orbital motion. 
the moment you are giving its multiple possibilities then you are allowing somewhat to rotate around the orbital and thereby some contribution is coming. You are not allowing a free rotation thereby the component will not be huge, but since it can interconvert between or among all these orbitals it gives you some possibility to give some contribution for the magnetic moment. I think that makes some sense if it is not 100 percent clear I will, I will try to look at more. Okay. I will come back on the magnetism in the next class as well. Now in the D2 orbital as you see three again once again three different ways the electron can be distributed and therefore this degrees of freedom as you can see or as you can tell degrees of freedom should give some sort of you know magnetic moment value and that is where you can get the orbital contribution orbital contribution so the experimental value once again will be little bit more than what we see for the two unpaired electron. Okay. So, the spin only plus some value should be there. I think it is not readable from there, but it should be in the slide. So, orbital angular momentum that orbital motion we are able to see in these cases. Okay. You look, look at it, I will stop it in here from here on I will discuss in the next class. So, so far today I, I think magnetism wise we, we did not discuss too much we have introduced the topic magnetism where the origin of the magnetism coming or magnetic moment coming into the molecule. It is the molecule unpaired electron that is responsible number of unpaired electrons should technically give you the clear cut idea what is the magnetic moment going to be there is some more to it of course in reality we know that it is orbital angular momentum and the spin only values that should give you that should combine, but you do not need to combine because it is somewhat restricted it is still somewhat allowed that is where when it is allowed then you have a better value or the higher value for magnetic moment right. And when that spin only plus orbital angular momentum is coming into picture that is what we have introduced, but we will be discussing from here on in the next class. Okay. Now, we will we have two more topic one is this magnetism the next one will be bioenergy two classes we should be able to finish. Yeah. Oh yes that is a good question sure it, it I think if I am getting I, I think in, in the beginning I did not get your point at the end what I, I get is. So, you have to think the total ensemble like if of course, if a molecule one molecule has some magnetic moment another molecule associated with it has another magnetic moment you have to basically assemble. Yes, at the end at the very last at the end we will see it is not the individual magnetic behavior will matter it is the total collective molecule whatever molecule you are associated with if it is only one type of molecule one center then that is of no problem, but the moment you have let us say cluster okay, one thing is attached via another thing through another thing then things are more complicated. So, that is what that is where I would like to take you to at the end of the magnetism. So, they, they can two magnet can communicate through a mediator one spin up another spin up is it going to be magnetic moving moment going to be addition of these two can can they talk with each other and reverse inverse let us say this is up in between these two magnet there is something which is communicating between the two can that communicator influence the total magnetic behavior. So, there is there is magnetic communication that is actually the basis for you know more fun in, in this area. We will not discuss a lot of case maybe one or two case we will discuss and then leave. Okay. So, I think is that the type of queries you are having or maybe I have taken you to a different direction some something related I initially I, I could not hear you, but at the end I think I, I hear, heard you correctly. Okay. Now, hopefully the next part will not be that long another uh, 20 minutes or so 
or 30 minutes maximum depends on how you how you would this is the third tutorial which is on coordination compounds you have the printout the question no problem i have the question here okay all right tutorial if you want to go i have no problem but i think it's important little i will try to get it done very quickly tutorial questions were uploaded in the module and nowadays all of you are having smartphone so if you have wifi connection you could have downloaded earlier okay don't come to my office to download it no okay just take it one of you should have been able to download it if you are really dying i you could have asked me i could have sent you or give you a print out okay anyway that doesn't matter too much it is in there if you like i can give you the print out the next time <laughs> who is going to pay for it <laughs> okay I, I, we can we can give it uh, iit can pay for it of course you are paying iit right no problem um so first question crystalline silver oxide is diamagnetic explain question number 1 okay so sometime you have to be little bit cautious some some not all of the question either in the exam or in tutorial are going to be straight forward there is something more into it so silver oxide you just calculate you figure out what is the silver ox oxidation state do it plus to what is the electronic configuration okay time up silver oxidation state is plus 2 so it is a d9 electronic configuration d9 on electronic configuration means one unpaired electron okay so it should be paramagnetic diamagnetic means to spin right pair or at least pair spin how it is this is where i, I was saying it is a trick question so it see it is a mixture of sorry yeah that's what it is so that is where it is a trick question so it's a mixture of ag2o and ag2o3 now you have to look back at each of them let me let me try to discuss you have to look back each of them silver plus silver plus 1 plus and silver 3 plus o1 minus is usually not possible you want to no, 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 don't worry i will i'll give you i will upload since i have made the slide i will upload okay no need to i mean if you bother you few are bothered to take the picture and take it it's a public domain thing why sh why should i not upload it okay uh, no need to just think little bit silver one please if you want to get it done quickly either you answer quickly or i give you the answer and go i will upload the slide okay now silver one is going to be d10 configuration that is diamagnetic this is silver one two of the silver one one is oxide another over here this is silver 3 plus oxide is always minus 2 6 minus so it has to be silver 3 plus silver 3 plus means what one d8 configuration right so d8 configuration can be can be diamagnetic okay d8 going to be square planar ah because silver is in high oxidation state it's a so this is where sometime the problem comes either the high oxidation state so it's the combination of both the ligand should be strong field or metal should be high oxidation state or the combination of higher oxidation state and strong field ligand then you are going to get that 
Okay. Sorry? Oxidation state. Ag2O plus 1, silver is in plus 1, oxide is oxide, all oxide, water, all oxide, metal, any oxide you see is minus 2. Water, if you split, H plus H plus oxide, 2 minus, right? Now that is fine. So, there the geometry as you can see over here, silver is linear and silver 3 which are in grain, uh, grain here, it is going to be square planar. Square planar, oxide, 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 silver is in the middle. Okay. Now, that is, you know, that is some, some question which is directly, I think these questions are something we have given pre earlier also, same questions for the tutorial. Now, work out the hybridization and geometry for the following complexes using the valence bond approach. First one is, okay, the second one is, why is that? Fantastic. So, nickel is in zero oxidation state, okay. Uh, and then therefore, you, you, I think this is, may not be feasible. Four of them, sp, sp3 hybridization, four of, the, four of the ligand, sp3 hybridization, it is going to be tetrahedral. Nickel tetracyanide, it is going to be strong field ligand and thereby the pairing will occur by valence bond approach. We are going to discuss it by valence bond approach and you know that pairing will occur. The Elect the hybridization will be then DSP2 that is going to be the square planar. Of course, you can explain it better by crystal field theory, but that is okay. All right, now I think I will skip this. This is the summary what is given here. Yes, that 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 is where over here OSO4 electronic configuration is going to be. 4F14, 5D6, 6S2. Okay. This is what is little bit difficult over here to do it by VVT. Anyway, if you do it by ionic approach, osmium 7 plus, it is going to be 4F14. Osmium, sorry, oxygen, osmium is going to be 8 plus, 6 plus 2, 8. So, 4F14. Total, it is going to be D3S hybridization and it is going to be tetrahedral. We do not call it D4 or anything, it is going to be D3S, 3 of D and 1 of S. D3S that is going to be tetrahedral by covalent approach. Similarly, you can look at and you can tell that it is going to be D3S as well. It is little bit on a borderline explanation. It's, it's, See, even these are, these are little bit older approach, VBT approach. So, the explanation is going to be little bit screwed at some point. But this is okay. You can kind of make sense for both of them. Okay. Now, this is most of them are clear cut. Tetrahedral square planar, tetrahedral square planar, linear, tetrahedral, tetrahedral. Linear is that silver ammonium where another molecule will be coordinating. Anyway, this is you should be able to find out by whatever you have done earlier. Tetrahedral place should not be a problem. Square planar are the one where you have the stronger ligand, okay, if it is a D8 configuration that is where the square planar comes into picture. But the real reason, the valence bond theory wise explanation was simply given, it is a strong field ligand and thereby it should be paired off and so on. That is what you have learned in the valence bond approach. But by crystal field approach, we have shown how things are going in terms of electron distribution, how orbitals are splitted and thereby why we are saying that D8 is going to be the square planar one. Okay. Now, 
while the most stable chloride of zirconium is zirconium tetrachloride that of palladium is palladium chloride pdcl2 yes it is also called relativistic effect what is that anyone wants to answer sorry um uh, no it's it's more of a d orbital see what we have seen so far it is that there, there are let me tell you there are these are palladium is going to be down the periodic table so you have already seen these uh, z effective because because the, those orbital the higher orbital which ever getting involved they are not neutralizing the positive charge effectively so as we were discussing in the very early class first class or so z effective is going to be very very strong the moment z effective is going to be strong they will be pulling out pulling in those d orbitals which are going to participate into the plus 4 oxidation state up to plus 2 is okay but plus 4 another two electron release although technically possible since z effective is very high it is going to not allow those electron last two electrons to get oxidized to palladium something like plus 4 relatively speaking so those due to the high z effective you are not going to participate very strongly or those plus 4 oxidation state achieving becomes difficult this is what it's called relativistic theory or relativistic effect or so called inert pair effect as you go down in the periodic table the participation of the electrons becomes less and less i mean if from first row to second row if you go there, there you don't see much effect as you go down below further it it becomes more prominent right so therefore although higher oxidation state is technically feasible but practically it becomes difficult to access those removing those electrons last third electron fourth electron becomes extremely difficult because z effective is higher this is going to pull in very tightly these are becoming more of a core like the electrons become more of a core i mean why it is difficult it's it become part of the core so much attracted it doesn't want to leave those or the atom is not going to leave those when next question question number 4 when high pressure is applied what type of electronic configuration is favored for a d5 transition when high pressure is applied what type of electronic configuration is favored for a d5 transition metal complex it is you are going to put high pressure you are going to take out the electron from those let's say dz square orbital which is shown in there and thereby you are going to kind of pair up the electron so because it leads to low electron density between the metal and the ligand that is along the bond axis you are going to end up pairing so you will get the low spin complex not clear when high pressure is applied i'll tell you it's not clear to me as well let me see what type of electronic configuration is favored for a d5 transition metal complex so d5 you are uh, going to have two configuration right t2 t2g t2g3 eg2 and another configuration is going to be t2g5 eg0 right now i think it's um, it is you are going to apply more field means you are going to split between the t2g and eg eg level if you are pulling out you are going to separate out the t2g versus eg still not clear i'm getting more confused i'll 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 bring it back okay leave it i think uh, 
pulling so base it is clear that you pull out then you decrease the electron density along the axis th can can you explain low electron density between the metal and the ligand that is along the bond axis what exactly is happening repulsion between what ligand and metal ligand and metal okay oh, okay 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 so when you are compressing wait 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 i'm not clear yet when you are compressing between these two then yeah. repulsion force to be much more yeah Okay, fine. I, I I think it's still not clear. Unde, uh, unless I am hundred percent clear, I will not. Okay, fine. It's it's interesting. Yeah. I think you are saying exactly what he is trying to say, but explaining uh, explaining becomes little bit difficult. Let me let me digest it little bit better. I will come back. Okay. Now provide reasons for the fact that a number of tetrahedral cobalt two complex are stable. where is the corresponding nickel two complexes are not anyone provide reasons for the fact that a number of tetrahedral cobalt two plus complexes are stable and where is corresponding nickel two complexes are not nickel two is what d8 d8 tetrahedral yeah square plane are more or tetrahedral versus octahedral even if you are considering and cobalt 2 plus tet tetrahedral and octahedral you are considering what you see that is what you have to see so d7 tetrahedral cfac and d7 octahedral cfac so what you see overall is d7 tetrahedral complex is greater cfac is greater then the d8 tetrahedral complex calculate the d7 cfac for tetrahedral field what is the d7 cfac minus 12 dt right d7 cfac tetrahedral d7 yeah tetrahedral is high spin all of high spin minus 12 right 12 dq what is for d8 minus minus 8 12 and 4 over there right minus 8 12 12 which one is more stable d7 is more stable so d7 is going to be cobalt 2 plus d7 is going to be tetrahedral you No, no. I am asking you to compare tetrahedral versus tetrahedral. Tetrahedral for D7, tetrahedral for D8. Octahedral for D7, octahedral for D8. You see, the answer is within that. Okay. So CFAC of D, D8 octahedral, D8 octahedral will be just just do the octahedral, simple octahedral. Okay. okay so it is going to be minus 1.2 or 12 delta q or dq and what is for d d7 minus no minus 0.8 or 8 dq d7 calculate that's what i was saying maximum cases calculate the cfac of both the geometry d7 what is the geometry d8 what is the geometry what is the splitting 
uh, sorry what is the stabilization energy this you should be able to do it in your dream now the statements here is correct cfse for d7 is more for tetrahedral case you have find out and cfse for d8 octahedral is more cfse of d8 octahedral complex is greater than d7 octahedral you calculate you will find so for this d8 it is going to be minus 12 dq or minus 1.2 delta 0 for d7 it is going to be minus 8 dq or 0.8 delta 0 or delta octahedral right the fact is here so the answer is correct the experimental fact is also given over here which you can corroborate ok fine provide reasons for the fact that a number of tetrahedral cobalt complex are stable whereas corresponding nickel 2 complexes are not that is the answer of course this is clearly shows that cobalt 2 plus prefer tetrahedral nickel 2 plus are not preferring tetrahedral i am not saying what it is right so answer is okay now using the crystal field stabilization energy as criteria indicate whether you expect the following spinels to be normal or inverse now calculate calculate and figure it out another 10 minutes we should be done calculate quickly see this is what i was really trying to tell you that you should be able to calculate the cfsc really quick write down calculate cfsc for fe 3 plus what we have asked you to for normal and inverse spinel you do not have to worry about tetrahedral you just think about octahedral fe 3 plus and fe 2 plus octahedral and it is going to be high spin high spin octahedral case you just calculate should i calculate no i can calculate fe 3 plus is d5 system high spin d5 system is zero d t2g3 is e2 so there is zero cfsc high spin iron 2 plus that is d6 d6 means high spin t2g4 is e2 fe2 plus having minus 4 dq as a stabilization energy fe3 plus having zero stabilization energy so higher oxidation state is having less stabilization lower oxidation state is having higher stabilization you are going to get an inverse spinel i guess i was discussing in the class as well now co3 o4 is a little tricky case because co3 is low spin high charge and of iron cobalt d6 ion is low spin because high charge even with weak ligand this is a tricky case co3 plus has a similar structure with d7 and d6 configuration this is going to be a normal spinel d7 d7 is what d7 d7 is what co2 plus is d7 iron cobalt d7 is co2 plus if you co2 plus with oxide it is not going to be the low spin it is going to be the high spin co2 plus lower oxidation state oxide is not that of a great ligand so it is going to be the high spin co2 plus high spin d7 so it is going to be minus 8 dq ok how about co3 plus co3 plus it is going to be d6 d6 it is going to be minus 4 dq if it is high spin 3 t2g4 eg2 
T two G four E G two. If it is high spin, D six. Now the problem is that is minus four D Q. Technically speaking, it should be inverse spinner. Higher oxidation state is having lower stability compared to the lower oxidation state. But CO three plus, this is an exception. You have to kind of remember. But uh, we'll try in the exam. We will try to give not such example. Okay. CO three plus being high oxidation state, and even with the lower oxid lower, uh, you know, even if with the you know weaker field ligand such as oxide, we still are going to get this uh, normal spinel. Okay. Next, few more questions left. By showing the details, determine the CFAC for the following complex. These are the very simple question. CFAC for Fe. Two plus Fe two plus is D six. Cl is a weak field ligand. Iron is two plus low oxidation state, so it's going to be the high spin. D six high spin. T two G four E G two. T two G three E G two cancels out minus four D Q. All of you got it, or should I wait a little bit? Okay. Thirty seconds. the titanium titanium is going to be sorry not tungsten my bad okay tungsten tungsten is going to be carbonyl is going to be strong field ligand almost the strongest you can get out there so it is going to give you low spin for sure t2g6 is e0 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually we when we count we just count for D until D is like D six. That's why we are counting because you, that was atomic orbital. You have to take into the atomic orbital into the more of a complex orbital or molecular orbital. We we never so far we never talk about. D two S D, you know, atomic orbital wise it is correct. D four S two D four, but in reality when you are doing anything with the hybridization or anything with, um, especially with uh, the complexation, you have to say it. It is a, it's a, it's a mixing. Orbital mixing is happening. Yeah, you, you have to say it is a D six. So T two G six is e zero. Okay, now explain what is meant by the term synergic bonding. This is a textbook question. Synergic bonding, I think you have studied for your exam before. It's the it's the pi bonding between the between the ligand. Sorry, sigma bonding between the ligand, this uh, ligand orbital and the metal orbital, and pi back bonding between the metal orbital and the anti bonding orbital of the carbon monoxide okay it's written in the way um, i think you have studied before synergic bonding it's the ligand donates metal gives back so it's i am teaching that's what i was trying to say you you tomorrow you will give me money that is the synergic bonding right once you become trillionaire i am sure some of you billionaire or whatever okay now the chromium 2 plus ion In CrF2 is surrounded by six fluoride ions. Chromium two plus. This is this is this is a clear cut. Def, I mean, statement is given. It is CrF2 we are saying, but it is surrounded by six ligands. Okay, it's surrounded by six fluoride. Of these, four are at a distance of two angstrom. Four are shorter. And the other two are at a distance of 2.43 angstrom. Explain this observation. Okay, so chromium 2 plus is surrounded by six fluoride ions in an octahedral environment. It's surrounded by six fluoride ions. Chromium 2 plus is what? D4. 
scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, D4, S2. So, 2 plus is going to be D4. Now, it is going to be T2G3, EG1. Right. So, the unsymmetrical distribution of electrons in EG orbital, that is what we were trying to show, right. T EG orbital, whenever you are having unsymmetrical filling, then there is a possibility of further splitting of the EG orbital. EG orbital can be splitted. This observation suggests that EG electrons in DZ2 orbital, because the two, two of them are longer, four, four are shorter, two are longer, little bit longer too longer means that directions it is getting stabilized. The ligands are getting longer that means ligands are not coming close. I think now I can explain a little bit that question. Anyway, ligands are farther and therefore, Z it is going to be Z out right slightly Z out and you are going to get dz square orbital stabilized. Ligand are far at the z direction, therefore, dz2 orbital is going to be stabilized, slightly lower in energy and the electron, since it is stabilized, electron is going to go there, because you, it wants to achieve the stabilized state, ok. Move on, that is it, the last question. Sure. Happy Raksha Bandhan.